It's my uh, pleasure to introduce the speakers and, and chair the questions for the first session. So we begin with um, Anthony, Anthony Clark, who will be known to many of you. Where are you, Anthony? <laughs> will be known to many of you, uh, senior tutor at Regent's Park, of course, and paper entitled Questioning Our Commitments, Exploring Hermeneutical Practice in Discussions of Human Sexuality. Anthony. Thank you, Steve. Protestants have a problem, and nonconformists have the biggest problem of all. We don't have a magisterium. In fact, we gladly reject any kind of magisterium. Sola scriptura has been our cry, scripture alone, rather than the traditions and teaching of the church. Now, as a Baptist committed to the Declaration of Principle, I'm not suggesting that we do create a magisterium. But we need to face the problem of how scripture should be interpreted without any central authority. This gives rise to significant tension. We've wanted the Bible to be clear. We've invested in its significant authority. But historical study on virtually any issue shows huge diversity of interpretation and sometimes little consensus. It seems clear that the most significant contemporary church issue in biblical interpretation for us is human sexuality. Having read quite widely, engaged in numerous conversations, uh, what strikes me is that the underlying challenge is not that we disagree on what the Bible teaches, which we obviously do, but that we are instinctively reading the Bible in different ways. We disagree because the whole way of reading the Bible is different. We practice different hermeneutics. And further still, uh, these hermeneutical commitments that we have, while sometimes are explicitly owned, more often are left implicit and unexpressed. This means it's difficult even to have a good conversation because my presuppositions about the Bible may be different to yours and our conversations simply miss each other. This, of course, is not just true of human sexuality, but the, the, the pressing nature of that issue for us as Baptists means that must force us to think more carefully about our own hermeneutics. My desire today is not to offer one more perspective on what the Bible teaches, but to explore how we read the Bible together. What I offer then in this paper is a discussion of how three or four authors, depending on time, have written on sexuality. While I've ensured there is some diversity of views, I tackle these four because of the way they raise hermeneutical questions for us. I'll briefly consider each one and then conclude with some questions we need to ask, I think, about our own hermeneutical position. So I begin, thank you Simon, first next, with Wesley Hill. In his contribution to the book, Two Views on Homosexuality, the Bible and the Church, he suggests that since the early patristic period, he quotes Irenaeus, there has been a shared understanding that the Bible has a center. And this should be understood Christologically. For Hill, there seem to be two fundamental components to his hermeneutical approach. First, that the Bible has an essential unity. And here we'll look to play down diverse voices within scripture in order to concentrate on a unity. And second, that this unity is found through Christ. So Hill writes, the properly Christian way to read the Bible is as a two testament canon whose various parts are not to be played off against each other but read synthetically with Jesus Christ as their orientating center. What's particularly helpful about Hill's account is his explicit desire to ground his contribution in a clear hermeneutical principle, a Christological center that shapes the reading of the whole. What's less clear is what he actually means. Let me suggest two reasons why. First, 
there seems to be another, a second, more implicit hermeneutical principle at play at the same time, which stands in some tension with his Christological center. Hill refers a number of times to something like a canonical shape of scripture and is using what we might call canonical criticism as one of his approaches. So for him, the Genesis narratives retain pride of place because of their canonical placement, as well as their use in the Gospels. The canonical primacy of the Genesis account means that Leviticus 18 and 20, read in this light, prescribe same-sex relationships because they do not have a place in male and female marriage. And for Hill, Augustine's theological vision of marriage is formed from the New Testament's final canonical shape. But what's missing, it seems to me, from Hill's account of canonical primacy is for any discussion of the way that Genesis and Leviticus may relate together, with the possibility that Genesis may have been written much later than Leviticus. Now, such historical critical considerations may not be definitive, after all, they're a commitment themselves. And, and there are some reasoned arguments for canonical approaches. But it's a committed position for Hill that is assumed and not argued for. What's also missing from Hill's account is any sense of how the canonical primacy of Genesis relates to the Christological center of Scripture. And so how a, read, a reading of Scripture with this center might relate to this canonical approach. Might there be a tension between affirming the primacy of Genesis and looking for a Christological center? Uh, for Hill, with his stress on unity rather than diversity in Scripture, there will be a tendency to play down any such tension. Others might find a Christological center which more radically reshapes other parts of Scripture. Uh, this leads me to a second point. While drawing on Augustine as a positive source, Hill then engages with the work of Robert Song as a critical dialogue partner. Hill is very respectful of Song's work and the dense, rich, and coherent exegesis he offers. But ultimately, Hill profoundly disagrees with him. What's interesting for our purpose today is that Song seems to me to offer a reading of scripture that also has a deep Christological center perhaps more so than Hill himself. And this leads Song to significantly relativize marriage in the light of the resurrection of Christ. Hill recognizes this, that Song's account is Christologically shaped. Sex BC is not the same as sex AD. And there are two aspects to Hill's work here. While summarizing what Song is doing, Hill makes no comment that they share a hermeneutical commitment together, but still come to quite different conclusions. Although perhaps it's a reason why they can better engage in conversation, because they share this Christological center. Those who share a commitment to this Christological center can discuss more clearly what this might mean. But what Hill does critique is his belief that Song has prioritized one strand of the New Testament teaching, the diminished place of procreation and the new place for celibacy. Thus, and I quote, Song loses a linkage between the three Augustinian goods of marriage. But given Hill's stress on both the canonical primacy of Genesis and a Christological center, he seems to be criticizing Song in reality for prioritizing anything over the unity of scripture, but also prioritizing the wrong thing. He wants to prioritize something else, which is Genesis. Next slide. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about Preston Sprinkle. As well as editing the book, Two Views on Homosexuality, the Bible and the Church, he's written a more popular book, People to be Loved why homosexuality is not just an issue. Sprinkle seeks to write sympathetically and pastorally 
concern for the pain of the LGBTQ community, but ultimately comes down very clearly on a very traditional interpretation of scripture. Sprinkle offers less explicit hermeneutical commentary, although some discussion takes place in the notes. He says he takes a critical realist approach, refer referencing both N.T. Wright and Kevin Van Hooser, arguing that while the Bible is not the only authority, it's the highest authority. It's absolute truth, but human interpretation of that truth is fallible. But despite, despite taking a critical realist position, he still insists that a human interpretation, which is performed in community, in dialogue with tradition, and under the guidance of God's spirit, can discover and understand absolute truth. Sprinkle appears to stress the realism much more than the critical engagement, and certainly comes to a different position to N.T. Wright, particularly with his assertion that human interpretation can understand absolute truth. There is no real place in Sprinkle's book for discussion of the place of narrative that you find in Wright, but a strong reliance on the use of historical critical method and linguistic explorations. We might notice a number of other hermeneutical commitments in the book which are not explored even in the notes, but which raise significant questions. First, like Hill, there's a deep commitment to a unified voice in scripture, based on a very strong view of divine authorship and so the a priori rejection of tension between texts. In discussing the Leviticus text, he comments rhetorically, did the same God who breathed out Genesis 1 also breathe out Leviticus 18 and 20? Was he confused? Sprinkle, for example, rejects a patriarchal reading of the Leviticus text because in Wright's language, this fits with his particular story to which he gives allegiance, a unity rather than diversity of voices. While he admits that some passages in the Old Testament appear to demean women, further studies suggest it's not clear that the biblical writers consider women to be inferior. His commitment to the one unified voice of scripture allows no room for patriarchy in the text. We find a similar approach in his reading of Ephesians 5 and 1 Corinthians 11, in which he argues for equality explicitly rejecting any chauvinistic readings and reads these texts through a non-hierarchical Trinitarian lens, which would seem to be much more shaped by later Trinitarian theology. Second, Sprinkle wrestles with the Leviticus texts, and in particular how Old Testament laws might not have contemporary relevance. Again, while there's no clearly stated hermeneutic, there are some clear working assumptions. Overall, Sprinkle takes what Adrian Thatcher would describe as a guidebook approach to the Old Testament, in which texts have a fixed meaning and provide a timeless ethical framework. Sprinkle is, of course, aware that not all Old Testament laws will be treated the same, and insists that those from a non-affirming position must offer evidence as to why these laws are binding and not simply assume this to be the case. Sprinkle then seeks to make such a case. He works on the basis that the most fail-proof method is to look for those laws that are repeated in the New Testament. He argues further that because the majority of Leviticus 18 to 20 are binding today, there will need to be a good argument to the contrary for the text on same-sex relationships not to be applicable. He also wants to argue that all the laws on sexual conduct are binding and gets himself slightly tied up in knots about the law on intercourse during menstruation, suggesting there is no evidence that this is not binding on believers. I think this raises two important hermeneutical questions. What is the value of Old Testament law as an entirety in the discussion of Christian ethics? Given we are no longer under law, 
and there is no theological suggestion that all Old Testament laws are binding or relevant, there seems to be a much clearer, needs to be a much clearer hermeneutical approach to reading the Old Testament. Second, uh, Preston recognized that there are, there are some laws, including those in Leviticus 18 to 20, which are specifically culturally bound. Not wearing different types of fabric, not shaving the edges of your beard. But offers no basis on which he decides which laws are culturally bound and which are not and simply assumes that the majority are deemed applicable, either in their full literal meaning or in the principle that drives them. It simply seems to be based on common sense. Thirdly, I want to talk about Dale Martin. As he gathers his collection of essays, Sex and the Single Saviour, specifically to discuss hermeneutics. Martin is best described as a post-foundationalist who adopts a reader-response approach to texts, meaning he insists does not reside in a text, it's not there already waiting to be found and applied to our context. Texts do not have agency and when we talk about text speaking, he says, we are using highly metaphorical language. The onus, he insists, is on the reader, and meaning is made when we read and interpret. Martin is concerned to undermine and ultimately reject the privileging of both authorial intent as something secure and knowable, and the historical critical method as the foundational hermeneutical approach. Neither, he says, a simple reading of what the Bible says nor a professional historical critical reconstruction of the ancient meaning of the text will provide a prescription for contemporary ethics. This does not mean, though, that there's complete textual anarchy. Martin himself offers two hermeneutical foundations. The first is that the meaning of a text is not controlled by the text itself, but by the community of interpretation. He draws on the work of Stanley Fish, Hans Fry, and George Limbeck, as well as also Catherine Tanner, who argued that historically the plain sense of a text was not something inherent in the text, but was established by the community and was a function of communal use. People, Martin insists, do not interpret texts any old way, but do so because of the way they've been socialized to interpret which can be challenged and changed. What's needed is not, he says, more careful attention to the text through historical critical study, but a more careful discussion of the interpretive community about the way we have been socialized to read texts. To draw an empty right again, we need to think about the story that we tell that shapes the way we read the text in the first place. The second foundation is that Martin, like some others, actually does in fact offer a biblical interpretive center. In a chapter that discusses the meaning of particular Greek words, he adopts a very strongly historical critical style and proposes that the double love command of Jesus is at the center. He says, whoever therefore thinks that he understands the divine scriptures or any part of them, so that it does not build the double love of God and of our neighbor, does not understand it at all. Martin draws on Augustine, but in a way that makes some changes to Augustine's point. Augustine's focus was to, on which text should be interpreted literally and which need to be interpreted more allegorically, because the literal meaning would violate the double love command. Martin suggests this is how we apply this to all texts. But we need to explore further, indeed question, Martin's fundamental claims. Martin rejects the idea that text can have any agency, and he rejects the privilege of authorial intent. There's always something quite ironic about a very carefully and rhetorically presented piece of work that argues against knowing any of authorial intent. I would certainly want to take a critical realist approach to such knowledge, 
but Mar Martin's book seems to offer quite a clear insight into his own authorial intent. His rejection of any textual agency has the feel of the full pendulum swing, insisting on one view so strongly as to counter its opposite meaning, of a much more positive approach that claims certainty in the meaning residing in a text. While it's of course true that the language of a text speaking or acting is of course metaphorical, this does not, I think, rule out textual agency. Texts do things to us. They can move, inspire, comfort. This is not to suggest they do this without our reader involvement. Here in Psalm 23, whatever its historical critical background, might comfort me in a moment of despair. This may happen because the way I read the text is shaped by long community interpretation and may or may not be in line with authorial intent. But this does not mitigate against the text's agency at that moment. I suggest we need a more balanced view of how texts and readers come together. Martin himself actually does this when he privileges the double love command of the gospel. Yes, of course it's shaped by communal interpretation, but there seems to be more than this happening. Why privilege this particular double love command? Part of the reason is that this is, a, this is Jesus' summary of what is most necessary, and therefore again a clear Christological center to Martin's hermeneutical strategy which is rooted more firmly in the text than simply in the interpretive community. Fourthly, I wanted to talk about William Webb, but I think, uh, uh, and his redemptive movement hermeneutic, but time has gone, so I'm gonna to move to the next slide, please, Simon. So let me try and bring all this together. Uh, based on these reflections, I want to offer 12 questions we need to ask, gathered in four areas. There could be more questions, they could be arranged differently. This is not meant to be exhaustive. But I think these are important questions. They ask us to reflect on the way we have been socialized in an interpretive community and to ponder the operant, if implicit, commitments that we have. So I offer these questions. Is the Bible a witness or guidebook? The language is from Adrian Thatcher, it's itself quite a binary position. It could be expressed differently, but it raises questions of inspiration, inerrancy, progressive revelation, etc. What's our starting point for how we understand the Bible? Is scripture manifold or one? In other words, to what extent is there a diversity of views in scripture that stand in tension with each other and offer different voices on an issue? Or to what extent does scripture present a common witness on all issues throughout its pages? Thirdly, is the meaning of scripture plain? This takes us to the Reformation idea of the perspicuity of scripture and what that means for us. That is, is it intelligible, but how much interpretation does it mean? How much expertise does it mean to read the Bible in cultural or transcultural ways. That's particularly a reference back to William Webb, who, who offers a very uh, strong way of reading the Bible, but it takes significant academic ability to do what he asks us to do. Uh, and then the shape of the Bible. Does the Bible have a Christological center? If so, uh, and many would argue explicitly or implicitly for this, how is it framed and how does it shape our interpretation? What is a genuine Christological reading of a text? Uh, does the Bible have a conical shape? What's the relationship between the Old and New Testament? What's the value of Old Testament in Christian theology and ethics? Does the Bible have a trajectory? Is the Bible the final word on everything, for example, slavery or Trinity, or is there something more to be said that builds on the biblical material? But if the Bible does not have the final word on something, for example, slavery, does it have the final word on anything? And how will those things be 
distinguished. Next slide, Simon. Uh, the Bible and the reader. What agency does Scripture have? What do we think Scripture does? What is the relationship between author, text, and reader? We're all working on some instinctive pattern into which we have been formed. What is it for us? Can we ask critical questions about the text, as opposed to simply sitting under the text? For example, feminist hermeneutics might rightly ask questions about patriarchal assumptions behind some of the texts. Yet not all, all agree that those questions are valid ones. And then what's the relationship between the Bible and the church? The church shaped the Bible, but now the church reads the Bible. How does the Bible critique the church and tradition if the church interprets the Bible? How does the church act as a community of interpretation or communities of interpretation? Whose voice is given priority in reading scripture? This is a challenge, for example, of liberation theology, which asks us to think about the privileged group who have controlled the interpretation for the community and therefore set the story into which we have been socialized. Let me find one final point in conclusion. It will be very easy, having reflected on these questions, can conclude that those who answer them differently to me and so would own different understanding commitments are not taking the Bible seriously, where well, obviously I am. In other words, this exercise is no panacea that simply makes more explicit the differences that are already there. What I'm convinced about is that generally our answers to these questions are commitments and pre-understanding that we bring to the biblical text rather than that we derive from the biblical text. They derive from the way that we have been socialized and formed in our various communities. It seems to me that if we are going to have good conversations about difficult issues, we need to own our hermeneutical commitments and be willing to talk about those first, because the difference might be the fundamental problem is we read the Bible differently from the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you, um, Anthony. Uh, we have time for conversation. Uh, if you're online, please type in the chat box and that will magically be relayed somehow. Um, if you're in the room, I think there are slips of yellow paper that we're asking people to write questions on. Um, and uh, that's one okay. <laughs> Um, thanks. Oh, gosh, yeah, that's definitely on. Um, I thought it was really helpful, and I think crystallizes a lot of the issues why sometimes it can feel like these discussions don't go anywhere because you're starting from different places. Um, I was interested that your commentary seemed to isolate readings of the text from, uh, sorry, it seemed to emphasize readings of the text as individuals mm -hmm. rather than as a community. Whereas, obviously, as Baptists, we're committed to reading the Bible in community, both within the room, but also the church militant, uh, so church militant, but also the church exultant, triumphant over time, so as part of the history of tradition, and as part of the global church. And I noticed that there wasn't a lot of discussion about the influence of historic interpretations or global interpretations on any of the readings that you mentioned. And I wonder if you could comment on that. And in particular, on whether that allows sufficient space for a doctrine of the spirit guiding the church in its interpretation over time, rather than individuals interpreting it in a way that we would any other secular text. I think that's a helpful comment. And, and yes, I think uh, certainly much more could be said about those things. What I, what I was trying to do was pick out, of course, individuals as examples. I wouldn't want to suggest that those individuals have been socialized in communities. And therefore, in many ways, they probably are representing um, a number of community traditions that have built up, whether they be church or academic ones. 
Um, and I think, that's, I think that's a helpful comment. Um, and to explore this further, I would want to do some more work, certainly, on the way that um, we, we need to pay attention to how communities work and communities interpret both, both historically and globally. Um, it would be an interesting question wouldn't it, to ask of why do our local Baptist churches read the Bible as they do? Uh, and maybe different Baptist churches read the Bible differently. That would be a very interesting piece of PhD for someone to do at some point, wouldn't it? You know, a piece of empirical research on why local Baptist churches uh, practice different home ministries, because I'm sure they do. But yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I think a, a further complication in community interpretation is the translation of scripture that's read, mm -hmm. um, where hermeneutics shapes the words that are chosen by the translator. So if I preach on the NRSV, it makes little sense to somebody sat in the pew reading the Good News Bible. Mm -hmm. So how can we bridge this kind of divide in a church context where people are effectively reading a different holy text? I mean, with great difficulty, I think the answer is, isn't it, isn't it, John? Because, I mean, that's, that's the reality, of course. Um, you know, the, the reality that you know, sometimes uh, gets overlooked too quickly, I think, in our churches is that the fact that we're reading the Bible in English means there are already significant academic work has been done to put this together, and that academic work is going to be biased, because all academic work is biased. Um, I think it's very difficult to do that. Sometimes, of course, you can do that by, by having explicit conversations with a church context and a sermon context about different interpretations and different translations, but you're right to point out uh, that's a fundamental question that, that often isn't one that's at the forefront of our church life. Anything online, Simon? Yeah, we've got a couple. Um, just to say to people joining online, uh, all 96 of them, um, when you're asking questions, can you make sure you address it to everyone and not just send it to the host? And then it's easier for us to pick up on them. Um, we've had uh, somebody offering an observation. I'll, I'll, I'll drop both of these to you, Anthony, and then perhaps you can respond to them both. Um, does not Jesus prioritize Genesis over Moses in synoptic teaching on divorce? Likewise, the council at Jerusalem in Acts uh, the Noachic covenant over the Mosaic. Um, so that's one. And uh, the other is a question. In your reading, what appears to be the dominant hermeneutical model in the UK? <laughs> well, uh, you have about 90 seconds. I'm going to ignore, I'm going to ignore, the, I'm going to ignore the second one because who knows? Um, uh, I mean, the, the first one is asking to get into, into how you interpret a particular text, isn't it? You know, in 60 seconds, it seems to me, you take Matthew 19 as an example, where Jesus begins with Genesis. He then talks about Deuteronomy, but ends talking about eunuchs, in which he actually undercuts the whole uh, Genesis basis of, of procreation at the beginning. So it seems to me that while Jesus might begin with Genesis, he doesn't end with Genesis. And actually, in that teaching, it's in my reading of it, in my own particular homogeneously biased reading of it, it seems to me that Jesus is actually undercutting part of the traditional Genesis interpretation itself. But, you know, other views are there on that passage, but that seems to me to be uh, not so straightforward as saying that Jesus prioritizes Genesis over, over Deuteronomy. Great, thank you again, Anthony. Great, thank you. Our second speaker is Ali Bolton. Um, Ali has spent the last 13 years doing pioneer ministry.